and happy Sunday. We want to start this Sunday off by being grateful. We're grateful for our family, for our spouse, for our friends, for uh, our church family, for our pastor and his family, and for everyone who listens to our Sunday School lesson. Let's get into this lesson. Today's lesson is Obedient Love. My name is Regina, and we are going to discuss this lesson today. And I always ask you to read the lesson for yourself, and I'm just going to discuss it with you. And hopefully we'll, uh, we'll both get something out of the lesson. So today is September the 13th, which would have been my mom's birthday. Our devotional reading is 1 Peter 5, 5b through 11. Our background scripture is Genesis 41, 14 through 57. Our key verse is Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word, shall all my people be ruled only in the throne. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Genesis 41, 39-40. And our uh, unit subject is struggles with love. Our lesson aims describe how God blessed Joseph and his difficult circumstances. Identify other situations in which God made himself known through the faithfulness of his people in their tribulation and write a prayer thanking God for his care during an especially trying time. For our introduction, it talks about immigrants face a host of difficulties when settling into new countries. You have cultural differences, um, you know, difference in the communities, neighborhoods, co-workers, it's a lot. One way that people that we all identify with ourselves is to remember our religious backgrounds. So when a particular religion or faith expression has been integral in the personal identity for decades, this challenge is challenges to that religion or expressions may result in an identity crisis. Joseph sold into slavery in Egypt, adopted various facets of Egyptian culture as his own, while being most resistant to change his one God worldview known as monotheism. But he did not lose his sense of dependency on God in this pagan culture. Whether in prison or in power, Joseph remained God's man, obedient, faithful and willing to give God the credit. And we should always do that. Our lesson context. Joseph was sold to an Egyptian official named Potiphar. Joseph quickly found favor in Potiphar's eyes uh, and was promoted to a position of great responsibility within Potiphar's household. Potiphar's wife, however, constantly pressured Joseph to sleep with her and Joseph refused every time. So Joseph actually ran from Potiphar's wife and his cloak was torn from him and left behind and she used that to accuse Joseph of attempted rape. Joseph proved himself worthy of responsibility. Dreams once again entered into Joseph's story. Through two fellow prisoners, Joseph's experience had taught him that only God can reveal the true meaning of a dream. The divinely inspired interpretation Joseph provided for each man's dream came true. One man was put to death and the other was restored to his position. Joseph, Joseph requested of the latter that after regaining his power, he would mention Joseph to the Pharaoh. But the man, however, forgot about Joseph for two years. And Pharaoh had his own incomprehensible dream. Nobody could tell him what it was. Though the content was easily conveyed, neither Pharaoh nor any of his magicians or wise men understood them. So in the first dream, seven healthy cows had come forth from the Nile River. They were followed by seven cows that were ill, favored, and lean fleshed. Pharaoh described them such as I never saw in the land of Egypt for badness. Amazingly, the ugly cows 
devour the healthy ones. Much of the same occurred in Pharaoh's second dream. Though the details differed, seven ears of corn appeared in a single stalk. Then they appeared seven withered ears that had been scorched by a hot east wind and withered ears produced, proceeded to eat up the fully grown ears. When Pharaoh spoke of the problem, the forgetful former prisoner remembered Joseph and told Pharaoh of Joseph's ability to interpret dreams accurately. Joseph was quickly taken from the prison, made presentable, and brought before Pharaoh. So we start our lesson with disturbing dreams, and this is verse number 25. Though Pharaoh had dreamed two dreams, they carried one and the same message. After Pharaoh told his dreams, the first words Joseph spoke tells us something of the heart of this faithful servant of the Lord. It is not me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. God, not Joseph, would set Pharaoh's anxious mind at ease. Verse number 26. The number seven in both dreams represent the number of years. Joseph's reassurance that the dream is one clarifies that the good kind are cows and the good ears represent the same seven years. Verse number 27. And the seven thin and ill-favored kind are cows, the seven, the seven ugly cows, and the seven empty ears represented a new set of seven years. And these seven years would be defined by famine. Verse number 28. Again, Joseph emphasizes that he himself was not the source of the interpretation. The significance of insisting on honoring God is particularly found in ancient beliefs about the way God ruled, the gods ruled. And this was a small gods here. Most people took for granted the multiple gods existed and governed the world. These gods, the small gods, are often associated with a group of people of a specific locale. So um, whenever a person moved to another nation or people group or group, it is believed that he or she left their deity jurisdiction and come under the reign of another. So Joseph, however, held a very different view of God. This is the God that we serve. One consistent with the Bible, with what the Bible teaches. This knowledge about God's character and dominion left Joseph with no doubt that God had sent the dreams and provided interpretation. Would follow through on what the dreams had revealed. So in verse 29 through 30, it says, For the first time, Joseph revealed specifically what the healthy cows and the healthy grain represented. All right, verse 31 the Hebrew words translated grievous describe something too oppressive or heavy to bear. That the good years would be forgotten by the famine. It would end up being a national devastating event, meaning the bad years would be so bad the good years would be totally forgotten. Once again, repetition serves to emphasize. This time the emphasis is by the dream having come unto Pharaoh in two forms. God was firmly committed to the years of plenty and a famine that the dreams pre predicted. Joseph spoke to Pharaoh. He might have remembered his own double dream that his family would bow down to him. God would bring these things to pass. The twofold format also suggests urgency in heeding the dreams. God would soon fulfill what he had revealed. But the implication of the twice dreamed dream was clear. Pharaoh had no time to waste in preparing for what lay ahead for his people. Joseph emphasized God's work in granting Pharaoh the dreams and giving Joseph the interpretation. Instead of taking credit for his own wisdom and insight, thus promoting his own interest, Joseph continued to point to God's work through him. God may have seemed absent to Joseph, especially when a fellow prisoner forgot him for two years. But God's continued favor in giving Joseph interpretations undoubtedly reassured the man that the Lord was present with him, even in or especially in prison. The Lord had not forgotten his faithful servant. At the beginning of Joseph's time, both in Potiphar's house and in prison, we are reminded that the Lord was with Joseph. Whether Joseph is aware of it yet or not, God never left his side. That's good news. He never leaves our side no matter the situation. Verse number 33, knowing what the dreams meant was of vital importance. However, the knowledge was worthless without a plan to use the information appro appropriately. 
Joseph further suggested a plan for the appointed man to put into action. Pharaoh's favor. Now this is verse number 37. The phrase all of his servants likely refers to a various official in Pharaoh's government, including magicians, wise men, who had been unable to interpret Pharaoh's dream. God's having blessed not only Joseph with understanding, but also the bestowal of wisdom on the Egyptians gathered. Verse number 38. Pharaoh's words here do not necessarily reflect faith in God. The holy gods that he's talking about here, there's no indication that he renounced other gods or came to believe in the one and only true God. He simply acknowledged that a deity or some deity, the Hebrew words translated plural, who sent the dream, also sent the interpretation to the man of his choosing. In any case, the phrasing acknowledged divine favor on Joseph. Though Joseph was a foreigner, a slave, and a prisoner in Egypt, Pharaoh did not mention any of this. Joseph showed himself to be the man Egypt needed. Perhaps to discourage any questions about Joseph's loyalty or skill, Pharaoh gave him an Egyptian name, and I'm going to say it, Zephnathaniya, which means something like revealer of secrets. Verse number 39. No one else had Joseph's divine given insight. The God who had sent the dreams had also provided a particular man to interpret them. Pharaoh agreed with Joseph completely in that the dreams and their interpretations were not of human origin. Verse 40. To Pharaoh, it seemed only right that someone with the insight and intelligence that Joseph clearly possessed should be the one to administer the plan he suggested. Joseph's responsibilities were similar to what they had been in Potiphar's house. The key difference was that the only person in a higher position was Pharaoh himself. God had been preparing Joseph for this position ever since he arrived in Egypt. Joseph went from pit to power. Verse number 50a, Joseph was preparing for the famine that his, he firmly believed was coming. Yet he was so confident that God had provided for those lean years that he was not hesitant about introducing new mouths to Egypt. This may foreshadow his care for other nations and especially his estranged family. Verse 50b, On was a city in Egypt located just northeast of modern Cairo. On was the location of a temple devoted to the worship of the Egyptian sun god Re, meaning city of the sun. Joseph's marriage to Asenath, the daughter of pagan priests, raised eyebrows. Her family was devoted to idolatry and pagan wives had a way of introducing compromise into a husband's devotion to the Lord. Yet, there is no suggestion here toward idolatry. Even in marriage to an Egyptian bride, Joseph relied on the only true God. Verse 51, Manasseh sound, sounds like the Hebrew word meaning forget. God caused Joseph to forget the hard times that had characterized his life for the previous 13 years. His father's house, this probably means that Joseph no longer held any grudges or ill will toward his brothers since he could begin to see those circumstances in a new light. At the same time, it is clear that Joseph had not forgotten God, nor had God forgotten him. What had been forgotten ensure that it was not really lost in his memory. Ephraim sounded like a Hebrew word meaning twice fruitful. Probably reflects the fact that God had given Joseph two sons. The name likely praised God for blessing, the name likely praised God for the blessing that Joseph was experiencing in Egypt. Furthermore, the name may have celebrated the abundance of a land about to be hit by famine. This suggests once again that Joseph confidently trusted God's provision during the lean times. Just as God had brought Joseph through affliction before, Joseph came to anticipate that God would bring his, him, his family, and all of Egypt through a great famine. The name Ephraim also seems to foreshadow the story of Jacob's family in Egypt for generations to come. God would not forget Jacob, who was Israel, just as God had not forgotten Joseph. Joseph himself was given a new Egyptian name, but he gave both of his sons Hebrew names. Doing this acknowledged 
the presence and provision of the God of his Hebrew family in his life. It also emphasizes that Joseph still thought about his family of his youth, apparently fondly enough to choose names of his native tongue. Conclusion. The God whom Joseph served and honored is the God we serve and honor today. No matter the circumstance, he does not change. Malachi 3 and 6, he remains in control. Whether we find ourselves in a pit or a palace, he is there. Joseph demonstrated radical faith in God, even though God might have seemed far away during the 13 years of slavery. God continued to give Joseph evidence that he had not forgotten the imprisoned man. How does your life witness in the same truth? In our prayer, Father, help us be mindful that as you were with Joseph, so you are with us. Strengthen us to greater faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. And our thought to remember, change is constant, but so is God's faithfulness. We want to thank you again for listening to our lesson, and we pray that you are staying safe, protecting other people by wearing your mask. We pray that this lesson gave you strength and gave you wisdom and knowledge to help you with this next week. We thank you, and God bless.